Grass. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Very happy Sabbath to all of you. As we open the word of the Lord, and as we open the word of his prophet, shall we seek his guidance so that our minds might be open to that which he's trying to teach us? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity we have to gather together. We thank you for this opportunity of gathering together on the day that you have blessed, that you have set aside to join with us. We thank you, Father, for the rest of our labors so that we may indeed draw closer to you. Help us today. There are many things that are written that we do not fully understand. Direct us as we open your word and as we open the word of your prophet. Help us so that your will is done. Help us so that we may walk with you in the path that you would set before us. To this end, we thank you. For this, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, what we're going to do this morning is we're going to touch on a few things that we started to touch on last week, but we're also going to return to 1 Kings 11 and address further some points that have been seen since last Sabbath. Now, Testimony 27 was originally published in 1878. So it was published before the demise of James White and before the apostasy that had come in full from Uriah Smith and from George Butler. Paragraph, page 36, paragraph one, Israel thought in the days of Samuel that the presence of the ark containing the commandments of God would gain them the victory over the Philistines, whether or not they repented of their wicked works. Just so the Jews in Jeremiah's time believed that the divinely appointed services of the temple being strictly observed would preserve them from the just punishment of their evil course. The same danger exists today among the people that profess to be the repository of God's law. Please observe this sentence. The same danger that existed in the days of Samuel and the days of Jeremiah exists today among the people who profess. Now, what does it mean to profess something? Are we not giving lip service without understanding the import of what we're speaking about? The be same a person, person of unclean lips. Would you repeat that, please? Be a person with unclean lips. Can be a point. Well, profession, profession can be uh, not necessarily a negative word. It just uh, depends, because it just means to to declare something that you believe, right? But some people just profess, like in Titus chapter one, they profess that they know God, but in their works they deny Him. In this comparison, in the days of Samuel. Mm -hmm. It's a mere profession. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so the same danger exists today that the people, among the people that profess to be the repository of God's law, they are too apt to flatter themselves that the regard with which they hold the commandments should preserve them from the power of divine justice. How often have we heard, I keep the Sabbath. I'm, I'm vegetarian. Yes, I eat cheese. Yes, I do things that 
Mrs. White did said we should not do, but I keep the Sabbath. They refuse to be reproved of evil and blame God's servants with being too zealous in putting sin out of the camp. A sin hating God calls upon those who profess to keep his law to depart from all iniquity. Neglect to repent and obey his word will bring as serious consequences upon God's people today as did the same sin upon ancient Israel. There is a limit beyond which he will no longer delay his judgments. The correction of God through his chosen instruments cannot be disregarded with impunity. The desolation of Jerusalem stands as a solemn warning before the eyes of modern Israel. When the priests and the people heard the message that Jeremiah delivered to them in the name of the Lord, they were very angry, and they declared that he should die. They were boisterous in their denunciations of him, saying, crying, Why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant? And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. Thus was the message of God despised, and the servant with whom he entrusted it threatened with death. The priests, the unfaithful prophets, and all the people turned in wrath upon him who would not speak to them smooth things and prophesied deceit. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, how often did we have straight testimony from Elder Jeff? How often did he weep over situations that have occurred? within this movement, within his own family. How like Jeremiah has he been in his faithfulness in giving this message of reproof? The unfaltering servants of God have usually suffered the bitterest persecution from false teachers of religion. Is this not giving as a prophecy, what we are to expect in the near future. But the true prophets will ever prefer reproach and even death rather than unfaithfulness to God, the infinite eyes upon the instruments of divine reproof. And they bear a heavy responsibility, but God regards the injury done to them through misrepresentation, falsehood, or abuse the same as though it were done unto himself and will punish accordingly. These are fearful words. One of the comments that I was raised with my mother was very clear. If you can't say something nice about someone, say nothing at all. We are not here to misrepresent what others are saying. We are not here to lie about what they're saying. We are not here to abuse others. And when we find that this is coming upon us, praise God. <clears throat> the princes of Judah had heard concerning the words of Jeremiah and came up from the king's house and sat in the entry of the Lord's house. Then spake the priests and the prophets unto the princes and to the people, saying, This man is worthy to die, for he hath prophesied against the city, as ye have heard with your ears. But Jeremiah stood boldly before the princes and the people, declaring, the Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city all the words which you have heard. Therefore now amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord your God, and the Lord will repent him of the evil that he hath pronounced against you. As for me, behold, I'm in your hand. Do with me as seemeth good and meet unto you. But know ye for certain 
that if you put me to death, ye shall surely bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city and upon the inhabitants thereof. For of a truth, the Lord hath sent me unto you to speak these words in your ears. Now, about what time was this written? About what time did Jeremiah prophesy? Well, this prophesying here is um, after, the capti after, after the captivity of Daniel. So, it's so we're speaking after 607. Yeah. So it would be, I think it's 604 This when this prophecy is given. Had the prophet been intimidated by the threats of those in high authority and the clamoring of the rabble, his message would have been without effect and he would have lost his life. But the courage with which he discharged his painful duty commended commanded the respect of the people and turned the princes of Israel in his favor. <clears throat> Thus God raised up defenders for his servant. They reasoned with the priests and with the false prophets, showing them how unwise would be the extreme measures that they advocated. <clears throat> so these sons of Judah, these, as it is said here, the princes of Judah, would they not have been like Daniel of the royal house? Mm -hmm. But these were the ones that were left behind. They were not the chief princes, as were Daniel and his three. The influence of these powerful persons produced a reaction in the minds of the people. Then the elders united in protesting against the decision of the priests regarding the fate of Jeremiah. They cited the case of Micah, who prophesied judgments upon Jerusalem, saying, Zion shall be plowed like a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountains of the house as the high places of a forest. They put to them the question, did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Judah put him at all to death? Did he not hear the Lord and beseech the Lord, and the Lord repented him of the evil which he had pronounced against them? Thus might we procure great evil against our souls. So through the pleading of Ahikam and others, the prophet Jeremiah's life was spared although many of the priests and false prophets would have been pleased had he been put to death on the plea of sedition, for they could not endure the truths that he uttered exposing their wickedness. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, we are called upon to examine points that are being presented. We are called upon to come together to examine these in the light of scripture. To do anything less, to make the decision that the words of some are not to be heard, that they are to be cast out, is going against scripture. But Israel remained unrepentant and the Lord saw that they must be punished for their sin. So he instructed Jeremiah to make yokes and bonds and place them upon his neck and send them to the king of Edom, the king of Moab, of the Ammonites of Tyrus and Zidon, commanding the messengers to say that God had given all these lands to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. that all these nations should serve him and his descendants for a certain time till God should deliver them. They were to declare that he refused to serve the king of Babylon. They should be punished with the famine, with the sword and pestilence till they should be consumed. <clears throat> famine, sword, 
pestilence, three judgments. Therefore, saith the Lord, hearken not ye to your prophets, nor to your diviners, nor to your dreamers, nor to your enchanters, nor to your sorcerers, which speak unto you, saying, Ye shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy of a lie unto you to remove you far from your land, and that I should drive you out, and ye should perish. But the nations that bring their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, those will I let remain still in their own land, saith the Lord, and they shall till it and dwell herein. <clears throat> Jeremiah declared that they were to wear the yoke of servitude for 70 years, and the captives that were already in the hands <clears throat> of the king of Babylon, and the vessels of the Lord's house, which had been taken, were also to remain in Babylon till that time had elapsed. But at the end of the 70 years, God would deliver them from their captivity and would punish their oppressors and would bring into subjugation the proud king of Babylon. Now, is this prophecy not noted in the book of Daniel? Was Daniel not studying about this prophecy as other visions came upon him? Yeah, well, in Daniel chapter 9, because Daniel knew how long he had been captive. But he also knew of the prophecies in Jeremiah. So it says in Daniel 9, 2, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now, the 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem isn't the same as the 70 years for Babylon. They, they're offset by two years. So he was trying to understand because he knew there was a period of 70 years regarding Babylon from, Jer from the book of Jeremiah, but also that there was 70 years for uh, the captivity itself. So, so he didn't fully even understand that when he's studying in Daniel chapter 9. He's trying to understand that issue. Okay. Ambassadors had come from the various nations named to consult with the king of Judah as to the matter of engaging in battle with the king of Babylon. So we have these ambassadors that have come from Edom, Moab, Ammonites, Tyrus, Zidon, along with Judah. They are all consulting together as to the matter of engaging in battle with the king of Babylon. But the prophet of God, bearing the symbols of subjection, delivered the message of the Lord to these nations, commanding them to bear it to their several kings. This was the lightest punishment that a merciful God could inflict upon so rebellious a people. But if they warred against this decree of servitude, they were to feel the full vigor of his chastisement. They were fully warned not to listen to their false teachers who prophesied lies. Today, <clears throat> we see many within the corporate church that have made fun <clears throat> of the prediction of July 18th, that have derided the messages that have been going out since 1989, that revel in calling those that follow the word of the Lord without flinching, they call them false prophets.
The amazement of the assembled council of nations knew no bounds when Jeremiah, carrying the yoke of subjugation, the yoke of subjection about his neck, made known to them the will of God. But Hananiah, one of the false prophets against whom God had warned his people through Jeremiah, lifted up his voice in opposition to the prophecy declared. <clears throat> now, does not this name Hananiah mean God protects? Is this also not the name of one of the three friends of Daniel? Wishing to gain the favor of the king and his court, he affirmed that God had given him the words of encouragement to the Jews. <clears throat> Said Hananiah, within two full years will I bring again into this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried them to Babylon. <clears throat> And I will bring again to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah that went into Babylon, saith the Lord, for I will break the yoke. I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. So I will bring again into this place Jehoiachin, the son of Jehoiakim. Is that not correct? Okay, so what are you asking? Jeconiah. Is that not Jehoiachin? Yeah, that's, yeah, Jeconiah is Jehoiachin. So, Hananiah here, if this, if this portion of Jeremiah is correct, would have been publicly prophesying publicly stating that within two years that the captives would be returned and so would the vessels of the Lord's house. Okay. It would be interesting if this was not about the, the time where he's, where he's prophesying this, that the close of this time could have been where Daniel and his friends called upon the Lord to help Nebuchadnezzar interpret his dream. And okay, I'm, saying, I'm trying to figure this out. So, so, I'm, I'm, so this here, Jeremiah 28, that's where we are, right? Correct. And now the book of Jeremiah is odd because it's, it's actually not chronological. Um, so it, it's, and, and, and we're not sure exactly why that is. It could have something to do with the fact that when the book of Jeremiah was being read, um, to, uh, Zedekiah, it was being cut up into pieces. Do you remember that? And then burnt in the fire. And so Jeremiah wrote it over again. Correct. Are you familiar with that? So. Didn't he, chapter, times, didn't he do that three times, throw it in the fire? I, I don't know about three times, but... I thought he uh, did, yeah. But in, in chapter 27, it says, In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, came this word unto Jeremiah from the Lord, right? So that this you have chapter 27, it's the time of Jehoiakim. Chapter 28 says, And it came to pass the same year, in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year and in the fifth month. So this would be, I think, in the fourth year of Zedekiah. In the fifth month. So remember that um, Ezekiel, he's going to prophesy in uh, the fifth year of Jehoiachin's captivity. Right. So this would be uh, so I've never tried to figure out exactly when this is. Um, 
but this would be around the time that Ezekiel is prophesying. Okay. Um, so I, I just never thought about this point before. So I, I apologize for having to, to think about it. But if 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 you look at uh, the fourth year of Zedekiah, it's the same as the fifth year of the captivity. Okay. Does that make sense to people? All right. So if, if we're looking at the fourth year of Zedekiah being the fifth year of the captivity, we could be looking at about uh, 602. No, this is 592. 592. Okay. Yeah. So this is because remember, Ezekiel's taken captive when Jehoiachin is taken captive. Okay. And the way that Jehoiachin's captivity, so I'm trying to think this, I might be doing it backwards. So Jehoiachin's captivity is when it says it's in the fifth year, it's counting it as if Jehoiachin is still reigning. But Zedekiah has a um, an accession year that is nearly one year in length. So the fourth year of, of Zedekiah would be 592. And this is in the fifth month. So Ezekiel writes in the uh, uh, in Ezekiel chapter 1, when he writes there, he says he's in the fifth year uh, of the captivity. Well, right? So the fifth month in which is the fifth year of Jehoiachin's captivity. So it's actually, or, or pardon me, in the fourth month, the fifth day of the fourth month. So this is just after Ezekiel's chapter 1. This is the next month. Does that make sense? I don't know. I didn't say it very well. That's an intriguing placement. Yeah. So I, I never noticed this detail before. So this is basically one month after Ezekiel begins to prophesy that you have this happening. And so when it talks about um, Jeconiah, that's Jehoiachin. So this is one of the points that Ezekiel, uh, it, that that's not really noticed, is Ezekiel considers Jehoiachin to be the rightful king because Zedekiah is just a puppet of Babylon. And even though Jehoiachin is in uh, prison in Babylon, he considers that, that Jehoiachin is still king, even though he talks about Zedekiah, things happening in the years of Zedekiah. Now, um, <clears throat> So then this prophesy of Hananiah uh, would appeal to the idea that Jehoi Jeconiah is going to be put back upon the throne, right? I will bring again to this place Jeconiah in verse 4, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. So he's saying that this is going to happen within two years. That's what he's, he's trying to say there. So it's already four years into Zedekiah's reign five years since Jehoiachin was taken captive. And so if he's saying it's going to be in two years, that would be seven years from when he was taken captive. But we know that he's not going to be released until the death of Nebuchadnezzar after 36 years being captive. So they're, they're, it's quite interesting. No, it so, is. Uh, I, <clears throat> So I, I stand corrected from my earlier comment, but thank you, because this, this does tie in very completely with the importance that we have of examining Jeremiah with Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so I guess the, the, thing, the thing that's interesting here in this context, because and that's the problem with Jeremiah, it's, it's all mixed up. Right. Like it's not in chronological order. And I actually have a, some some uh, copies of Jeremiah placed in order so that the chapters are in order, okay. which is kind of interesting. But um, so it gets a little bit confusing and some people get confused. They think, oh, this must be talking about, you know, the fourth year of instead of Zedekiah, the fourth year of Jehoiakim. And they think that it's a typo and so forth. So, so there's varying opinions about it. But um, what what we have then is when he's talking about this destruction here that's going to be coming, 
he's talking about the destruction that Ezekiel has been prophesying. The destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Right, where if in, earlier in Jeremiah, uh, you know, he's going to be talking about, because uh, he starts prophesying in the time of Josiah. Right. Right, so he's prophesying all the way through until the end of uh, uh, Zedekiah's reign. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Jeremiah, in the presence of all the priests, and the people that it was the earnest wish of his heart that God would so favor his people that the vessels of the Lord's house might be returned and that the captives brought back from Babylon. Now, if we're recognizing 592 as a possibility, that means that this would have been 15 years after Daniel and his friends were taken captive. Is that about right? How, how long you're saying? Okay. Um, so six. Seven. Yeah, it's fifteen years. <clears throat> okay. But this could only be done on condition that the people repented and turned from their evil way to the obedience of God's law. No half-hearted obedience, all or nothing. Jeremiah loved his country and ardently wished that the desolation predicted might be averted by the humiliation of the people. It's no longer upon the leadership, it's now upon the people. Are the people willing to repent? But he knew the wish was in vain. He hoped the punishment of Israel would be as light as possible. Therefore, he earnestly entreated them to submit to the king of Babylon for the time that the Lord specified. He entreated them to hear the words that he spoke. He cited to them the prophecies of Hosea, of Habakkuk, of Zephaniah, and others whose messages of reproof and warning had been similar to his own. He referred them to events which had transpired in their history in the fulfillment of the prophecies of retribution for unrepented sins. Sometimes, as in this case, men had arisen in opposition to the message of God and had predicted peace and prosperity to quiet the fears of the people and to gain the favor of those in high places. But in every past interest, in every past instance, the judgment of God had been visited upon Israel as the true prophets had indicated. Said he, the prophet which prophesieth of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. If Israel chose to run the risk, future developments would effectively decide which was the false prophet. But Hananiah, incensed at this, took the yoke from Jeremiah's neck and broke it. And Hananiah spake in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the necks of all the nations within the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. So in this situation, from what Theodore has addressed, this could well have been in 592. We know what occurred in 586. Within six years, three times two years, 
the temple was demolished. Jeremiah had done his work. He had warned the people of their danger. He had pointed out the only course by which they could regain the favor of God. But they had mocked his words. Men in responsible positions had denounced him and tried to arouse the people to put him to death. Yet his only crime was in faithfully delivering the message of God to an unbelieving people. Brothers and sisters, I read this, I consider carefully that it is not that long ago that there were those that once were joined with us that were making the comment that Elder Jeff is dead. You should not listen to him. They mocked what he had to say. They had been in the forefront of mocking the warnings. They are choosing not to study. They are not choosing not to come together to study the words of the prophet, the words of the Lord. This is where we are to be today. We have been told by Mrs. White that destruction is coming upon Nashville. That is a prophecy that will be fulfilled. We have been told that we are to study the so-called minor prophets like Zephaniah along with the book of Daniel. <clears throat> if we are to do that, are we also not to be looking within these minor prophets along with the books of Ezekiel and Jeremiah. When it comes to Jeremiah, there will be a day where he hears the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Is this not what we wish to hear as well? Now, as we were talking at the outset, there are some points from last week's study in 1 Kings that we need to revisit. So we're going to bring that, that chapter back up. So where do you wish to start? If we were to start here, <clears throat> First Kings eleven twenty eight. Okay, so part of let me get here. First Kings chapter eleven. Now, so what we have is we have um, the first thing is just the enemies. So the okay. Lord is going to raise up adversaries against Solomon, and and there's there's three of them. So the first one is going to be, and, and these are ones that are going to have to do with David, right? So they have their, their enemies that, that are the result of situations under David's reign that are then going to come against Solomon. So the first one, if you remember, what was his name? What uh, verse do you wish to start in? Well, that goes like verse, well, if you go back to verse 9, where this goes. Okay. The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. And, and verse right. 10, he commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, for as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. How be it? I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son for David 
my servant's sake and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. So that would be the tribe of Simeon that would then be given, right? Is that what we had decided? We were trying to decide whether that was Simeon or Benjamin. So Simeon fits. Okay. And the Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. He was of the king's seed of Edom, right? And this goes back to the time of David when they were destroying the Edomites and Hadad had fled. And then he had gone into Egypt when he was yet a child, right? And, um, and then he's going to, uh, later on, um, where is this here? Okay, in verse 21, when Hadad heard that, heard in Egypt that David slept with his fathers and that Joab, the captain of the host, was dead, Hadad said to Pharaoh, let me depart that I may go to mine own country. And Pharaoh said unto him, but what hast thou lacked with me that, behold, thou speakest to go to thine own country? So the thing about this is he's going to come from Egypt, even though he's an Edomite, right? Right. That's an interesting detail. And then it says, um, uh, there's going to be, a God stirred up him another adversary, Reason, the son of Eladiah. Now, Reason seems to be more a title of the Syrian kings, and he's going to reign in Damascus, right? So we have Syria and Egypt. Both of them are going to be providing adversaries against um, Solomon, right? And then the third is going to be Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephratite. So he's, he's from uh, the no northern Israel, right? From Ephraim. Is that what we understand the Ephrathite is? Right. So in other words, this would have been a, an enemy from within his own house, rather than having these two enemies that are outside of Israel we have a third that's from within Israel. Yeah, so we do have these three powers. Egypt, that's the king of the south. That's the world, right? That's okay. the globalists, that's the UN, all those things. We have Syria, that's the king of the north. Okay. Right? Even though it's not Babylon, but still it's, it's a symbol of the king of the north. And then you have somebody that's from northern Israel, which would be the Protestants. So you can take those symbols that we have, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, and you can see them here. But they aren't a threefold union. That is, this is not the Sunday law at this point. Okay. Right? So, so they're not a threefold union in the the examination of the Sunday law, but there's still three of them. Right, there's three of them, and they symbolize those three powers that will unite at the time of the Sunday law. Okay. Okay. So um, now the other thing that's going to happen, though, is that there, there becomes this type here or this symbol and, and having with the ten and the two, right? So the kingdom then is going to be... Um, so after we get through Jeroboam, uh, we get to Jeroboam in verse 28. And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor, and Solomon seen the young man that he was industrious. He made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. So um, the house of Joseph there is just Ephraim. So Jeroboam becomes a leader in northern Israel. So Solomon is allowing him to do that, right? Okay, so so you're saying that from, from the way that this is being approached, that the house of Joseph is Ephraim alone. It's not Ephraim and Manasseh? No, Joseph always refers to Ephraim. Okay. Not to Manasseh. It's just another name for Ephraim. That's that's the way that it, it occurs in the Bible. So Joseph never refers to Manasseh, even though Manasseh is the son of Joseph. Okay, and then it came to pass when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prop, so he's going to be made charge over northern Israel, and he's going to be coming from Jerusalem, 
And Ahijah the Shilonite found him in the way and clad himself with a new garment. He, so he has a new garment. And when the two were alone in the field, Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it in 12 pieces. So uh, it seems to, um, and I'm pretty sure that the new garment is on Jeroboam. But, right. Yeah. So he takes Jeroboam's garment, rips it into 12 pieces, and he gives him 10 pieces. Right. So we know that those 10 pieces are the 10 tribes. And, and he tells, but he will, shall have one tribe for servant David's sake. So they have this in brackets, whether that's just reminding us or whether he actually says that uh, because they have forsaken me, I've worshipped and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon. Right. So the false worship, all these things that he was not supposed to do. And. So he just repeats this about taking the kingdom out of the hand of his son, which is Solomon. And it shall be, if thou wilt hearken unto all that I command me, thee, and walk in my ways, and do that which is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as David my servant did, that I will be with thee, and build thee a sure house, as I built for David, and will give Israel unto thee. And I will for this afflict the seed of David, but not forever. Solomon sought, therefore, to kill Jeroboam, and Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt unto Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. So it seems that what, what ends up happening here is, is Solomon is going to put Jeroboam in charge of the tribe of Ephraim. He's going to be like the leader there. But then we have this prophet Ahijah come and do this prophecy, and this would be found out by Solomon. So Solomon then seeks to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam flees into Egypt until the death of Solomon. And this, this then is going to be when we get to chapter 12 of 1 Kings, where we see that Jeroboam, it, when Solomon dies, Rehoboam is going to um, listen to the advice of the younger men. And that's going to open up the door for Jeroboam to unite northern Israel against uh, Judah, right? So, and then we're going to have the two golden calves and and all those things that follow. Now, the the point is that we have this history is typical, right? Which we already understand, and and this is going to set the stage for this uh, civil war that's going to happen first in 977. And then we're going to have a civil war later in 742, um, 235 years later, right? Okay. So, so we're going to have this civil war. And this history, then, the way that we lined this up when Heidi and I were in Arkansas in 2018 and we were studying the civil wars, we recognize there was a parallel between the Civil War that happened in 977 and what we would call the Revolutionary War. Okay. Okay. And then, and then we look at the Civil War that happened um, in 742, and we can see that that is going to end up paralleling the Civil War in the 1860s. All right. And then all of those revolutions and civil wars, they're going to parallel what's happening in our time. That is, there's we found a chronological connection between the past and the present, which I'm not going to go into right now. Uh, but the thing is, this, this can't be the Sunday law in First Kings. Right. This is a prelude to that. So if we look at the time of in America, America arises at um, with the fall of of the papacy. Right. All right. Connection with that history. And so what are the three powers 
that exist at the time in 1798 that we would call the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. How would we, what are the three powers there? Well, wouldn't the beef still be the papacy in 1798? Yeah. Okay. And the dragon power? Yeah, France. France, right. And then, of course, the false prophet being the United States. But there is no threefold union in 1798. Right. Okay. And so that's what history is being paralleled here in 1 Kings chapter 11. So we have the seeds, but we don't have the, um, basically the plant itself has not, has not grown. Yeah. Now we also then have though these 10 and this two. So the 10 is Northern Israel. And Northern Israel is the Protestants, right? Because it's going to be at the end of the 2520 for Northern Israel that um, we're going to see this rise of the United States, correct? Okay. And, and so this history here, going back to 977, with the division that happens at the time that Solomon dies, and its connection to the 2520 for Northern Israel and for Judah, that's connected to our time. And, and the way that it's connected is we see that the players, the, we here we have literal, but we're going to see spiritual in 1798. But they're all there. Now, France, of course, is going to move, that is, the dragon power moves from France to the Soviet Union. But then it's going to move from the Soviet Union to the UN, right? Does it move? Does it move from the Soviet Union to the UN directly, or is it Soviet Union to Russia? And well, then... no, it, it moves to the UN. So okay. the dragon power moves from when the fall of the Soviet Union happens. I mean, one of the things is we see Mik Mikhail Gorbachev, he has a position. What's his position in the UN? I can't remember specifically. But he, he moves to the UN. He's connected with the UN, right? I'm looking it up. Yeah, I can't remember how that, how that occurred because it was a long time ago. But, but what we see is the dragon power moves to the UN. And, and the UN, which is the globalist, it's, it's more the, the structure of that, of the world. It's Egypt. It's going to conquer the United States, right? Because that's what happens. So the globalists have conquered the United States, which is also Greece. And I know I'm trying to tie a lot of different threads together here. Um, but the main point is you have these powers at our time. You have the papacy still. You have the globalists and you have the United States. But in our time, they are going to come together as a threefold union. But they don't in these other histories. Because even though you have these enemies of Solomon, they're not united they're just like existing as enemies of the church. I guess we're living at the end of the world, too. Mm -hmm. And Judah, of course, represents the church. Now, the church is in apostasy, and that's why these things are happening. Right? God's not going to bring his judgment upon the church if they're being obedient. So, so th those are, those are the thoughts that I had. I mean, I probably need to get them more organized. Uh, but we can see that this history here is important to understand for our time, because it's it's repeated at different times throughout history. 
specifically in 1798, where the three players come into view with the rise of the United States as spiritual Judah, or spiritual Israel, I guess. And then the Seventh-day Adventist church is going to be God's true church in that time, and they're going to be persecuted by this threefold union. Okay. Now, Did you find out what part he had to play with the UN? I, I'm not finding it. Okay. I'm, what I did find that was interesting, though, is that Gorbachev was the eighth and final leader of the Soviet Union. Okay. Yeah, and I, I might be remembering something wrong about that, but... Um, Okay, I know he did. Um, because I know he had something to do with the UN, but I can't remember exactly what. But but anyway, the, when the Soviet Union fell, mm -hmm. that that spiritual power moved moved to the UN. That's my understanding of it. Okay, so that would have meant that the spiritual power of the King of the South would have moved to the UN about 1991. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, in uh, December 8th of 1988, Gorbachev... Um, He was calling for this new world order. I think that's the, uh, the point there. He made one of the those new world order speeches. Right. Uh, let me see if I can find this. Because that would have been just before the time that he would have been the, the final leader of the Soviet Union. Yeah. Yeah, so a new world order through a universal human consensus, right? So this is going to be a year before the fall of the Soviet Union. He calls for this new world order. And we know that that, uh, that phrase was taken up by others. Right. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to have to find more on that. But it was... Uh, Okay. Yeah, I just can't remember all the details. But hopefully that wasn't too confusing. That's well, interesting. Because then if, if we have the elements here, and mm -hmm. it's shown in, in the Bible as, you know, the elements of a threefold union, but it's not a threefold union that has yet come together. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at this through history from the last, you know, 30 odd years. Then we can see the development more clearly of that threefold union in our own time. Yeah. See, part of the thing that's interesting when you, when you read, um, Avro Manhattan or, um, even just our understanding of things. We know that there are these three powers that they're all vying for the control of the world. Right. Right. You have communism, you have the United States, and you have the papacy. And they're all seeking to control the world. They're not friends of each other. They only become a threefold union because of necessity, believing that one of them can then win in that battle and that they have to unite against their enemy, which is God's people. Right? Right. So, so in the past, these enemies exist, but they're never united until the end. Okay. Now they are, you know, typ typologically in certain points of history where there's threefold enemies that come against God's people. 
um, in a united fashion. But, but in reality, that threefold union is an act that occurs just before the second coming. And that's the time in which we're drawing towards. Okay. But, they, but they are enemies of each other. They're all vying for the same piece of property. Right. Like a worldwide, worldwide three union. Mm -hmm. And and that that threefold union, of course, puts the papacy upon the throne of the world because the papacy ultimately will win in that battle, but only temporarily. So, in this in this situation. Would we be saying that as it hey dad is the representation of the beast with with this with um well no you would have um um the one that's in Damascus what's his name there hey dad is in Egypt right so he comes from Egypt um and then uh, it's. Oh, we're applying Jeroboam as the false prophet. Right. So that's the United States. Okay. And then you're going to have Reason, the son of al -Adha. He's He's in Syria, in Damascus. So he's the king of the north. So in other words, in, the, in, this, in this situation, with yeah. Reason as as we're saying here the beast mm -hmm. are we then saying that reason is also representationally the soviet union because he fled from his lord had a dreaser or had a deezer of the king of zoba no no he would be the king of the north he would be the papacy well i'm okay is the king of the south is going to be egypt so that's greece that's the UN. That's, okay. Right. And then, of course, the one who's got the uh, northern Israel, uh, Jeroboam, he's going to be representing the United States. False prophet. So, so in this reason represents the papacy. Hey, dad would be representational of uh, Egypt, France, Soviet Union. Yeah, the dragon power. The yeah. dragon power. Yeah, and see, we already kind of understood this about Jeroboam. I mean, we understood this about Jeroboam with the, the two golden calves. And, um, uh, and that history representing um, our history. But it's just it's it's just making these connections that chronologically to this history, to our history, to this repeat of history. Um, let me see. I'll, I'll actually bring it up here, um, if that's okay. Sure. Um, I'll just have to. I'll stop it. the share. I guess I could do. I just have to get the, the actual slide here. It should be here. Um, this is OK. I just have to fix a couple of things on here because of this. Oops. I don't know what I did there. Just have to move this over. Okay. Now, what you have is um, this is 977. This is the 15th day of the eighth month. That's Jeroboam offering on the altar in Bethel. And you're going to have 235 years to 742 BC. 
and that's going to be at the beginning of the reign of Ahaz. And there's a civil war going on that's going to last for three years. But from 742 to 723 is going to be 235 months. So we have these 235 years, and we could call this the Revolutionary War, and this is going to be the Civil War. So this Civil War, we already understand, a parallels with the Civil War in, in American history, and that the Revolutionary War would be similar to the Revolutionary War in 977. Now, I can go from this Civil War ending um, in 739 to November 28th, 1782. And that's going to be, um, these are dealing with these Thanksgiving. So this was all about the Thanksgiving prayers and different things uh, that happened. So I'm not going to go into all the detail and I got to fix this other side too. So let's just fix this. Um, okay. So we have these 25, 20 years. Now, of course, we already have the 25, 20 years that um, relates to the 25, 20 for Northern Israel. But couldn't we uh, apply Leviticus 26 to Northern Israel as a progression, just as we do with Judah? <laughs> Okay, how so? Well, we know that that northern Israel is going to be an apostasy, and it's going to have a match to it. Now, we just start at 723, and we go to, to 1798. Right. But there still is a progression that happens. So during this civil war, there's going to be this prophecy within 75 years, right? We know that 19 years into there the 2520 starts with the captivity of Hoshea in 723 BC. But we see the same type of prophesying against um, northern Israel, right. or southern Israel, pardon me, and we're going to have Manasseh, and then we're going to have this progressive destruction of four. Okay. Um, but it doesn't necessarily happen, you know, exactly the same for northern Israel. But the fact that there is these 25, 20 years that we can mark, um, we can see that this civil war here is going to connect to this revolutionary war that's ultimately going to connect to the end of the 25, 20 for northern Israel in 1798. But, and, and I don't have that in here. So I just have this 25, 20 years going to 1782. And, and that's because I'm marking these uh, proclamations. Um, so the Civil War begins, the North falls, and, and that's going to be um, in this history, that's going to be mirrored in what happens in the Civil War. It's going to be the South that falls in the Civil War in American history, right? Right. So we have a battle between the King of the North and the King of the South. And so we've already connected those histories. What happens in 1863, we've already connected it to 742, right? Because that's the, the chiasm. Right. And... But we can see that things happen in a reverse order. So it's a mirror. So the 2520 that begins with northern Israel, it's going to, it's going to be in a reverse order of the 2520 for Judah. That is, it's going to mark, the 2520 is going to still be marked with the king being taken captive. Manasseh for northern Israel, Hoshea for, or Manasseh for Judah, pardon me, and Hoshea for northern Israel. So this is a mirror, this king being captive and this civil war at the beginning is a mirror for what happens at the end. I don't know if I'm saying it very well. I don't have it all illustrated here. 
but, but do people see what I'm talking about? So in other words, what you're saying is that what's happening at the end is the inverse of what happened at the beginning. Right. Yeah, it's a mirror, right? Okay. Okay. And now we have um, from 723 BC. So I have a bunch of things in here which in, without a lot of explanation wouldn't really make sense. But um, from 723, there's 2,345 years to August 9th, 1623. And August 9th, 1623 is the first civil Thanksgiving in the United States. So what I've done is I've been connecting these uh, counterfeit worships right all the way back from Jeroboam offering up and we know that Jeroboam he's a king but he's off working as a priest church and state are united he was offering at the altar on Bethel on the 15th day of the eighth month and we can connect that that 235 years the 235 years there that we have is followed by 235 months. That is 19 years is 235 months. And then we have this period of 2,345 years and then 154 years from August 9th, 1623 to December 18th, 1777. And that's going to be American Thanksgiving being proclaimed. Um, uh, November 1st, and it's going to happen on December 18th. So that's the first American Thanksgiving that's proclaimed after 1776. And then you're going to have the Thanksgiving and the National Day of Prayer proclaimed November 5th, 1782, the first being observed on November 28th, 1782. So that's why I have that uh, 1782. And I have to go into that in more detail again to, to explain it. And then George Washington's going to have the first proclamation of a Thanksgiving that's going to be on the fourth, uh, fourth Thursday in November. So that first time, that's in 1789. So that's going to be seven years later. And then you're going to have these fasts, national fasts that are appointed. There's one in 1795 that's going to be connected with the Revolutionary War and another one um, in 1863. Uh, there's going to have this national fast that's appointed for April 30th, 1863. Okay. And there's, again, a lot of history around that that I'm not going to go into right now. And then the Thanksgiving of November 26th, 1863. So one thing is you'll see it's the same date, right. November 26th, November 26th. This is going to be George Washington's Thanksgiving, the first time it's proclaimed as the fourth November in uh, fourth Thursday in November. And then Abraham Lincoln is going to make that permanent. And on both situations, the proclamation is made on October 3rd. All right, you see that? Interesting. And what's the significance of October 3rd in our history? Anybody remember? Uh, Tess's presentation, right, in 2018, October 3rd. It was a Wednesday. And that's where uh, Daniel from Brazil talks about October 13th as being 126 days from the camp meeting in Italy when time is first proclaimed. Um, so then I'm going to deal with Trump's Thanksgiving, etc. Now there's going to be from 1782, 235 years to November 23rd, 2017. And November 23rd, 2017 is Trump's first Thanksgiving. So can we see that this is a mirror, this 235 years is a mirror that goes back here, these 235 years from November 22nd, 977 to the end of the Civil War, or it's actually, I guess it's not the end, it's to 742, to the Civil War beginning. 
that, that that is an interesting situation because you know when you're bringing that up that this is to the end of the civil war on one end and it's in the you know at the civil war at the other so yeah so so when we yeah so when we look at this so jeff had seen this uh, we presented it um I presented it in November on November uh, 10th, uh, 2019. Uh, it was Sunday at the School of the Prophets uh, in three presentations, and Jeff agreed with it. So he said, we already understand this and that we should see this as correct. Now, we also have 252 years from the repeal of the Stamp Act to November 22nd, 2018. And this was a prediction that we were making regarding um, this mirror. So we were looking at our history with this history. And it didn't pan out the way that we thought it would, but the whole purpose of this was, can we predict the future? And, and I know this doesn't relate specifically to this study. It's more to the presidents of the United States. But one of the things that we saw in, in this context was that um, we could set up these dates and these structures and that there is significance in them, but that these are all types that we shouldn't have expected an event that we could predict, but that what, what occurred was things that were typical of what's going to happen. So, so this ties in the civil war that happened in the United States that's been going on it ties us way back to this history here uh, at the beginning of the dividing of the kingdom. So we know God declares the end from the beginning and it's this mirror that is the important point that, that needs to be understood. What was and the uh, stamp, what was the stamp act again? Well, the stamp act is um, they had to, any paper that you bought, you had to pay a tax upon it, and it had to have um, an official stamp on it from uh, the British Empire in order to um, in order for that to be uh, used, right? So they were it was basically a stamp on paper, and there there was a repeal of the Stamp Act. So this is a protest very similar to the Boston Tea Party. Yeah, I see. Okay. Idea. So yeah, it's. It's not something people generally talk about now, but it was part of what led to the revolution. So, so yeah, there's a lot of history in here. There's a lot of detail. It would be quite a long study to go through. But, but the point is we can look at these histories, what happens with Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and we can see that those parallel what's happening, what happened with Trump, and we're still dealing with the events or the after effects of what happened with Trump getting elected. But we're in, we're in a mirror process. And so we, we need to recognize it here. There's still more to come. So there's still quite a bit more to come. Yeah. So, but all of these things were given for us to understand how we're repeating history and that what this movement went through um, since 2017, specifically, is part of this uh, repeat of history. It's, it's typical. It's not, it's not actual. That is, we don't have, we don't have everything completed. I don't know how else to say it, other than that we can see at the beginning, all of that history dealing with Solomon, even going back to David, is all going to be repeated in our time. And, it, and it's connected chronologically through the 2520. So, yeah, I wish I could just do a better presentation of it, but that's the, the best I can do in this short time. So, okay, anything else that you want to finish up with? Well, at this point, um,
I would I would say that let's let's take the the remaining few minutes. Let's cover back over a little bit of Zephaniah. Okay. Now the situation that we're going through here with this, with the types <clears throat> in the Civil War and the Civil War analysis that we're doing for what Judah had been prepared to go into and then what we saw with U.S., we have pieces that we are seeing here, but we don't have all of the pieces yet fulfilled. Would that be a fair statement? Right. So sometimes we look at part of a puzzle and we think we see the whole picture. Right. But there's details in the pieces that we haven't seen or that we haven't put in the right place that are important for us to see the whole picture. Right. And, and so what God has been doing is he's been putting into place the various pieces. And we will see that our history is all connected to the history of the past, both chronologically and typologically. Okay, there's no different. I, I don't disagree with you there. Yeah. Yeah, so, so we just haven't seen everything yet. And so we need to keep searching. Well, we can see what, what there was. The time leading up to 742 and some of the things that happened in that after 742. And we have pieces that will occur within our own history that are going to be extremely similar to what we what we were seeing in those other periods. Right. And, and we can make the mistake of thinking that um, just because we see some parallel now, but that is the whole picture. Right. And, and we know what, what our movement has been is we've zoomed in on and seen these structures, these reform lines, midnight, midnight cry. But those are just zooming into something because in a um, um, in a fractal, you're going to have that occur. You zoom in and you can see the same thing that is when you zoom out. But we can't mistake the zooming in for the whole picture. No. We haven't no. zoomed out all the way yet. But it doesn't mean there's no value in looking at zooming in because we know what we're seeing now is going to tell us about the future. And so there's two things. We have to understand the past in order to understand the present. Okay. But we also need to know what it is, what ground we are passing over. That is, we need to know that we are following a pattern because then we can not make the same mistakes as people in the past. Because if we think we're in the wrong place in what experience we're going through, Just like if we look at the disciples, were okay. the disciples wrong to believe that Christ was going to set up his kingdom? That they were looking for the Messiah to set up his kingdom. They weren't wrong about that idea. Right. They didn't realize where they were and what needed to be accomplished first. So there was right. nothing wrong in the idea that Christ is going to set up his kingdom. But Christ was telling them, it's not yet. Right? He has to suffer. He has to die. There's things that have to be fulfilled in prophecy. It wasn't wrong for the Millerites to proclaim that Christ is going to come. And that the 2300 days were at an end. And the 2520 was at an end. It was wrong, though, for them to... Um, Nothing, it's not wrong for them to believe that Christ was going to come. I shouldn't really say that because that's what everything was pointing to. But when they were disappointed, it was wrong for them to reject the evidences that God had led them to that conclusion. And so the same thing with this movement. God has been leading us 
and things don't necessarily happen the way that we expect but we should still be able to see that God is leading and that he's leading us for a purpose and so people shouldn't be disappointed if things don't happen the way that we expect because that's not what our faith is based upon it's based upon so there was a statement that was made in one of the studies where someone said that we didn't need all of this chronology and all of this information because they had faith that's all they they needed if you remember that statement and what would be wrong with that statement well faith has substance i mean uh, yeah so if you have faith on something but you don't know what the evidences are for that faith when it doesn't happen the way that you expect what will happen to your faith fold up yeah but if you if your faith is founded on something when things don't happen the way that you expect what's going to happen to your faith it's going to begin to dry up real quick well if it's founded on something if it's founded on something it'll continue to grow yeah it will actually grow because you will actually see more evidence as things unfold if you understand the past but if you don't understand the reasons for your faith it's not really faith it's just presumption and we can't afford to be presumptive especially at this time of verse history right. Right. we need to have a solid faith based upon studying god's word and based upon understanding our experience as we pass through it, because our experience only has significance if we understand the reason for our experience. Right. So to me, this is one of the most important points of this movement, is that it is a movement that is experiencing Millerite history. And yet, often when we experience those things, we don't have the perception to recognize that we're experiencing Millerite history and we give up. Right. Yeah. Okay, so anything else there, Dwight? I don't have anything else for today. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we got Stephen's study in the afternoon. Now that, that will be at two o'clock mountain today. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, so if you can close with prayer. All right. Gracious Father in heaven, thank you, Father, for showing us this time. For this is the time that the prophets had looked to live within. Help us to understand this time. Help us to compare what has gone before with what we are seeing now. I thank you, Father, for each one that has attended this meeting and joined with this meeting today. I thank you for those that will view this later. Help us now, Father, guide us through this Sabbath day. Help us to be prepared to be willing receptacles for that which you would show us. Direct us now. Please be with us, each one. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.